sustainability is in, and it's shaping trends all across the board, from agriculture to fashion and gourmet dining. This week on Full Frame, a look at the tastiest, chicest, and coolest innovations in sustainability. I'm May Lee in Los Angeles. Let's take it full frame. <laughs> So what do you need to grow thriving crops? Soil, sun, water, right? Well, maybe not. What if you could grow crops with little to no water? Jill Farrant is a professor and research chair in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And she's currently leading the development of drought-tolerant crops. Now, they're called resurrection plants because they can survive in a drought and then resurrect themselves when they are irrigated. Further developments of these plants can help provide solutions for feeding populations in dry and arid climates around the world. Ferrant's research has received international praise, and in 2012, she was a recipient of the L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. Joining us from Cape Town to tell us more about the potential impact of her research is Jill Ferrant. Welcome to the show, Jill. Great to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Well, Jill, let's first start off with your childhood, because I know that your interest in the outdoors and plants began at a very early age, and you spent a lot of time outside. I know there's one story where you went outside once, you saw a dry plant, and then the next day it rained, and it was all vibrant again. You went home and told your dad, and he said, that's impossible. Tell me a little bit about that moment for you. An uh, interesting moment because obviously I was, I was a very observant child, observant because weather drove the mood in our home. If it wa my father was a farmer and if it wasn't raining, that was a problem because the crops wouldn't be watered. If it was raining with hail, that was a problem because the, then the crops would be damaged. So being observant, I actually noticed this dead looking plant. Um, came back and saw it, you know, resurrected the next day, wrote it in my nine-year-old diary and forgot about it, to be honest, for many years later. But it was one thing I, once I, when I discovered the fact that someone else had published about this many, many years later, I thought, wow, I wonder if that's what I noticed. And yes, it was. So at that point then, when you realized that there was something to this, this idea of resurrection plants, is that when you decided, all right, I'm going to go and research this and see what this is all about and maybe it could lead to something new? Yeah, ab no, absolutely. I mean, the moment I was un got un the understanding of how that these plants could lose all of their water, remain in that desiccated state for years before and, and yet still be alive enough to when water comes to resurrect and start growing within 12 hours, I knew that this was a potential solution to drought um, and it wasn't under the where at the time though to what extent drought would be happening in my country and with Africa being a rain fed um, agriculture this is a, a crisis for us at the moment so yeah I'm very lucky that I actually started to do this research some 22 years ago and you've kept at it well Jill since I'm not a scientist and most of our viewers are probably not scientists can you explain to us in layman's terms how a resurrection plant actually works how do they work? Um, the, the big trick is that most living organisms go under a lot of tr um, stress if they lose water. So resurrection plants, when they first start to feel a drought, immediately perceive that somewhere down the line that there might be something that they might have to lose more water than they really want to at this point. Turn on a whole lot of genes which actually facilitate a, a very safe loss of that water, protecting membranes, protecting all sorts of things that normally fall apart when there is no water in the environment. And the nutshell of my research really is that there are other models out there that do this. Most of our crops, most of our plants use seeds that, are, that can dry down to very low water contents and yet be a, uh, survive and we store our germplasm um, as seeds. So the phenomenon is not often seen in most plants, in vegetative tissues, but it is in seeds. Now what I have discovered is, and, and lots of collaborators who work with me, um, is that in fact what resurrection plants do is that they use those pre-existing seed genes. They're already in the genome. Mm. They just switch them on in vegetative tissues when that's normally silenced in a crop. And so the whole trick, I guess I'm telling you where I think you might go for my next question, the whole trick is right now, 
how do resurrection plants switch on those, seed, those genes in their roots and leaves? Can we mimic that right. in a crop so that when water loss beca or drought becomes severe, the plants simply dry down and wait for the next rain? And so now that's what that is at the heart of your research, right? Because you're basically trying to create these crops that will mimic this behavior so they can survive through really any kind of condition and still produce uh, and be bearing fruit, right? That's exactly what we're trying to do. Um, I do, I know that there are people out there going, oh, how productive will this plant be if it's spending a lot of its time in the dry state? And that's a very real question that we need to answer. But the reality is that as long as there's water, this plant will pick up, start growing, and it in initially, at least, a little bit faster than it would have done beforehand. Mm -hmm. It's almost to make up a bit of lost time. So in a season where there's sufficient rain, we will have absolutely the normal yield we would always have. In a season with a drought, we will still have a good year. In a season with an extended drought, we will still have a crop. It might not be fantastic. Wow, so it can produce no matter what the conditions are with very little water or uh, plentiful water. That, that's fascinating. And also you said it doesn't take as long as the normal crop. Well, you know, depending on where we're trying to put this, if you're going to put it into an annual, which is uh, a crop which will only grow for a short amount of time in order to get, to get a lot of seed for us to eat, um, we, would ha we would have to maintain that that, that that plant can continue to grow even in a, t in a time where it would not, not normally do so under normal environmental conditions. But what I'm thinking is going to happen, certainly here, is that normal environmental conditions aren't really going to prevail for most of the time. We're going to have extended droughts, a lot of heat. Right. These plants withstand all of that. We will also get a lot of cold and a lot of wet. And so what we're trying to do, I think, in the, in the long term, is to get a very resistant, a resilient crop. A crop that will do well under, under hydrated conditions, but actually won't die under the more extreme conditions. And Jill, uh, you know, these days uh, we hear so much about the issue of global warming, climate change, these extreme weather conditions that we're having, and one of them being drought, uh, the lack of water. Uh, so if we don't try to pursue things like you're working on, what are we looking at? What's the dire future? I mean, I use that word, but I think that's probably what everybody figures. That it could be very dire if we don't do something about it. Yeah. You know, I think what I'm potentially offering is, is only one of a many other solutions that really have to be evolved. There are going to be areas in our, on our planet where it will be much more conducive to be the, the breadbaskets of the world. And I guess what, must, what we must do is capitalize on those areas and the food must be shared. Then in areas where you're going to have extended droughts, we're going to have to, for local food security and, and subsistence farmers, start growing the crops that are a way more drought tolerant. And my idea is to actually intercrop these, to actually use um, cereals with um, protein rich seeds and things like that so that the subsistence farmer has a balanced diet that will come out um, over a year with various crops that can actually um, grow through various seasons uh, to be productive at the right time. Mm. Jill, I know that uh, the estimates for you are that th is that you want these crops to actually be fully functional through your experimentation in about 10 years time. Uh, so is that realistic at this point in your research? It's realistic dependent on one condition, that I get enough money to do this. <laughs> um, I think any scientists all around the world always say, wow, we just don't have enough money, we don't have enough money. Um, and, and of course, collaborators and myself who now kind of know, we think we know what we need to do. It's a matter of getting the money and doing it. We are um, writing grants and doing all sorts of things, but given the right amount of money, uh, to complete what we think we need to do, I guess proof of concept for five years, roll out by 10. Okay. And um, Jill, in terms of what this potentially could do uh, to, for world hunger and providing the proper nutrition to parts of the world that we all know are suffering from extreme poverty and hunger, uh, is, this, is this the answer? As I said before, I think it's one answer. I think they mean, we're going to have to be very creative in other ways of producing food too. Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to say that this is going to be a great solution for all of Africa. I think it's going to be a small solution, um, a small drop in an ocean that we really need to do a lot more with. It. Sorry, I'm feeling a bit, it's late at night for me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Big your pardon. Okay. I'm stumbling a bit. 
That's okay. Well, Jill, let me ask you this then. Uh, once you are through with this research, because you're saying about five to ten years' time, uh, what's going to be next for you? What's, what's on the horizon? Ah, I'm one of those people who can never say no to a new challenge. Um, one of the big things that we're going to be facing in Africa, is, um, and I think worldwide too, is, is salt stress. Because as the soils get more um, uh, dry, you get a lot of increased salinity and ions and things accumulating. So one of the things we are starting to look at is crosstalk between stresses, crosstalk between water uh, deficit stress, drought, and salt stress, because often that will go hand in hand. So even as we speak, we are starting to look at, at things like that. For me personally, um, I don't know if I'll ever retire, but I have my dream is to use South African medicinal plants, and we have an enormous amount of variety here for medicinal purposes, to try and start letting people be able to grow plants that can be used for food and medicines. Okay. Jill, you know, I'm curious. Uh, some people might look at what you're doing right now uh, with manipulating, you know, these resurrection plants and trying to figure out how they work, and the final product being sort of Frankenstein creation uh, because you're manipulating so many things. Uh, is that the case? Are these are these actually safe? It's a, a question that everyone asks me, but simply because the perception that genetically modified organisms, genetically modified crops, are going to be Franken foods. I feel that the discipline has been given a very bad rap um, because it can be exceptionally safe. It's the ethical reason for what you're doing, what you're doing, the dis using that technology for, is what should be driving the answer. Um, so yes, of course they can be, and I think with all the concern that's around now, we are making sure that they are safe at all levels before they're released to the public. Again, long-term trials have to be done. We might be eating these things for 10 years and find that there's something uh, crazy happens to us. I doubt it. But, you know, those, those are the things that we have to face every day. Right. In some of the technology being developed, for example, to make meat, stem cell research from beef, you know. Uh, is that safe? Don't know. Yeah. But to be working on an animal seems more desirable, and if I may say this, than, than working on a plant in most people's eyes. <laughs> I think, I really think that plants being the base of the food chain, we really need to look after our plants. And, Joe, from the scientific community, have you gotten positive feedback? Are they, are they liking what you're doing? In the main, yes. Like, I think most scientists understand what I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to do it, and they applaud that. Um, so, yeah, I, I've, I've had very little criticism other than people saying to me, well, you're going to make GMO foods. How's that going to affect us? Mm, okay. Jill, you have some plants in front of you uh, on the desk. Can you tell me what, what you have? So the very dry looking uh, twigs here is a, a resurrection plant which has gone green 12 hour, in 12 hours because I put some of those twigs into water. So just to show how rapidly this happens, this plant's been, I, I harvested them two years ago, dry. So they are still very much alive and it's just one of the many species I work with. This one has got a fancy name as they all do called Myrothamnus flabellifolius or alias the resurrection bush. Um, it's, it's got a lot of, or most of these resurrection plants have incredible chemicals in them to protect against the various stresses they have to uh, survive. And so a tea, why well, I bought this one particularly, because a herbal health tea has also been made from the leaves, um, which is good for stomach complaints apparently. Highly, high, high in antioxidant. So Jill, that's amazing. So you harvested those dry plants two years ago, but then you resurrected them in, within 12 hours. That's amazing. Absolutely. It is amazing. I think that to me, if anyone is interested, there's some videos on my website which actually shows you the, the time lapse of these things going from the extremely dry state, full up and healthy, within 12 hours. Wow, that is incredible. Well, Jill, thank you so much for joining us today. Fascinating stuff you're doing. You're welcome. Cheers. Well, Jill's work is solving a sustainability challenge on dry land, but what about food crops from the ocean? Tuna, shrimp, tilapia, and salmon are among the most popular seafood eaten around the world, but that's also been their downfall. These once plentiful species are now dwindling because of our overconsumption over the last 30 years. Now, recognizing the depleting supplies, chefs around the globe are experimenting with new, lesser-known types of abundant seafood, often referred to as trash fish by fishermen unable to sell them. Full Frame's Mike Walter takes a look at this growing trend.
their hunt begins before dawn. For the past week, these commercial fishing boats harvested the sea floor, searching for the best catch. Today, their efforts are paying off. I mean, today we're selling pollock for 350 a pound, which is unheard of 20 years ago. It was like five cents a pound. So the value of our fish seems to have increased the past five to 10 years pretty strongly. For years, popular fish like Atlantic cod and haddock were the staples for New England fishermen. But overfishing and environmental changes drastically reduced these fish in their nets. Instead, they were catching what's called trash fish, species like redfish, pollock, and hake that only sold for pennies at the dock, earning them the nickname. That's when chefs, fishermen, and scientists came together to determine how to fill the culinary void. The fisherman would suggest a species to a chef, and the chef would say, oh, I don't think so, I don't find that delectable, or, you know, that's going to break my knives, or that's too difficult to handle. And then the chefs would suggest a species that was also underutilized, and the fisherman would say, well, that's too far out, it's going to cost us too much money to bring in, or it's too difficult, we have to brine it or ice it or whatever, so we're not going to be able to be profitable. Eventually, they settled on the underloved fish that would work for both chef and fishermen, starting a broader trend in the U.S., using species in the kitchen that are more abundant in the sea. I think the real trend is in understanding what's in season, what's bountiful, and basically eating with the ecosystem and adapting and understanding how to work with the seafood and the species that uh, Mother Nature makes available to us. At the Inn by the Sea near Portland, Maine, they understand and they are adapting. You'll always find underutilized fish on the restaurant's menu at this luxury waterfront resort. We incorporate it in our lunch menu every day in the form of hake tacos. We're certainly working to help you know, promote the common man, the common fisherman, and re really the backbone of what the economy of Maine once was, especially here in southern Maine or along the Gulf. Now, Maine's fishermen hope more diners will embrace the seafood they catch, no matter what the species or nickname, and help usher in culinary trends that will keep the fishing boats afloat and the sea's harvest abundant. For Full Frame, this is Mike Walter. Coming up next, trendy fashions with an environmental conscience. We'll be right back. Our next guests are on a mission to return clothing manufacturing to its makers and to utilize and innovate sustainable, environmentally sound production practices. From their first biodegradable espadrilles to their Bolivian alpaca sweaters and dramatic dye colors made from organic materials in India, Industry of All Nations is creating clothing with a conscience and connecting their products with the people making them. Founded by brothers Patricio, Juan, and Fernando Gerskovich in 2010, the company blends their love of design with their eye for fashion and passion for creativity. Here to share more about their sustainable, ready-to-wear tale are Juan and Fernando Gerskovich. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, and your other brother is missing, right? He's yeah. in Miami. He's in Miami. Okay, okay. Well, tell me, how did three brothers from Argentina decide all of a sudden that they were going to go into sustainable clothing and then source it from around the world? Because I think you two are trained architects, right? Yeah, yeah. So from architect to clothing, how did yeah. that happen? Well, it happened, I think it, it happened is a, a lot of ingredients that created this formula for us to create industry of all nations. Um, our parents, our parents are well, were fa fashion designers in Buenos Aires, ah. so we grew up in the fashion business in a way. Um, apart from being, being our trained architects, we've been always well, we had a very entrepreneurial way of living and philosophy in our brains and hearts, and we've been always very curious about brands, uh, how people consume, and how people sell and buy and so it was a point that uh, as consumers we were getting so 
and excited and was not, it, it was like not making sense to us and every time we went to buy something and we would look what was made it was made just in, like only in china or right. maybe in a, in a few countries in southeast asia right being that every country in the world produces or used to produce but for some reason not for some reason because just for the reason that it was in those countries it was it's more cost effective or people are paid right. less yeah of course yeah so yeah. see also very see also very every brand this plant decided to get rid of productions in every country and take it there with cheap where it's like more more um, affordably made mm -hmm. Because companies were just worried about the bottom line, right? It's they just yeah. want to save money, and then they want to produce it really quickly to get it out. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and it became it became uh, normal, uh, normal. Yeah. for us. Uh, let's say for the past 50 years, uh, that products were just made uh, in one part of the world. Yeah. Uh, and the truth is that humans, we 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 are used to make things. You know, uh, collectively make things, buy things, use things. Uh, so that's 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 what 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 we realize that, hey, uh, we need to start making things again and, and care about what was being made. Right? It's about the quality and how it's made, and you know the people the, who are making it. So people. obviously, your company is about trying to source those products that are actually being made by real people. Yeah, yeah. So. Because if not, we're we're buying the when they are buying like orphan products. People that are ma products are made by people who have no idea what they're making. One day they're making what is the same company. One day making watches, the other day making raincoats, the other day making boots. Right. We have no connection to what they're, what, to what they're making. Ah, the connection. No yeah. connection whatsoever. Yeah, that's right. that's super important. Like it work as a as a basic activity that we do. Uh, it, it has to have meaning for us. Otherwise, it's, yeah. it's uh, completely nonsense. Well, that's obviously why you started this company that has such depth to it, right? Let's talk about yeah, I mean, how you, you go about... You, you explained it very well when you introduced us, no? It's like, basically, the main thing is to bring productions, productions back to, to, the, to the original makers. makers. Right, to the makers. Yeah, well, that's let's talk it, that, about... That's how it all started. Let's talk about how you find those products, right? I mean, you go all over the world to try to find these products. For instance, yeah, why know. did you choose Bolivia to go and get these alpaca sweaters? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> talking about uh, wool, no, close to where during the winter, um, there is, there is um, Bolivia, Peru, this part of the, the world in the, in the Andes Mountains, that's part of their tradition. Uh, families there, they've been breeding alpacas or llamas uh, for generations. Right. And um, it was a matter of, of, of connecting the dots, discovering them, working with them, and make their craft available for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and in the case of, of, of this specific project, the Alpaca project in Bolivia, it's, 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 it's a great example of, of the overall industry of all nations concept. Um, it's, it's creating the added value of, yes, the, the places have their, their, they are gifted with raw materials, for example, uh, or with uh, manufacturing techniques. Now, uh, in this case, we work with this cooperative that there are um, 1,000 farmers. They all own a piece of land. They all breed their, their alpacas. And then the whole cycle continues from the land of the alpaca where they're breeding all the way to the finished product like, like an alpaca sweater. And that's creating that value of the whole process from the raw material all the way to the finished product. That's a great thing that can happen. And that's, that's how our supply chain uh, works. So it's full circle. Like full you circle. were saying, yeah. Juan, I mean, there's a connection there with that's, everything. Yeah, and that's what we aim in every project, in most of the projects that we, we, we in, um, how do you say? Most of the projects that we uh, approach. We approach. Mm -hmm is to go and produce with the people who grow the fiber, right. breed the animals, instead of like just grabbing what they, what they grow with their land and right. take it somewhere else to produce it. No, let's encourage those people, apart from like making the raw material, making the finished product. 
and it must be gratifying for them to actually see from start to finish what they're doing for your company yeah, instead yeah. of like you said they all of a sudden their material is just taken and they have no idea what's yeah, happening exactly. it's, it's gratifying yeah. and, and it's uh, it's uh, economically uh, perfect because then you have like this whole chain of people of the community that are involved in the process right. not only not only of 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 exporting the, the the raw material but the the meal where they process the wool the needers that need the sweater so then you have this this four circle that it's uh, yeah that's that's basically how how all the way from a little community to a country the way communities and countries can thrive right. equal, when they can manufacture with what they produce from their land and here's the other benefit that I really love about what you guys do is that there's a sustainability uh, topic and issue of how sometimes clothes, oftentimes how clothes are manufactured, terrible for the environment, yeah. um, really wasteful. Yeah. Uh, there's no concern yes. for anything but just getting it out, making that money, and yeah. then just leaving. Yeah, so that's, so, a, that's a whole other aspect that yeah. we take in consideration as much as this first conversation that we're having, no? How, how production needs to start being more sustainable. Right. And we need, we start to, need to forget to make like things like fast and cheap for a big profit. Because here's an example that uh, is on your website. I watched a video of the organic dyes that are used in India. Yeah. Right? It's mesmerizing. This video, I, it was like, art, it was like artwork, watching these guys make this dye Complete. from organic material. Complete Tell me the dyes. importance of using those type of dyes versus the conventional way of dyeing material. Yeah, well, it, it, it all, it, before the Industrial Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, I think, was in 1850 or 1870. Before that, so I'm talking about like 100 and something years ago, Every cloth that people wear on this planet, they were around like a billion, a billion, the, 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 the population of the earth was around a billion people. So these billion people, we, we, the world we, would dress with clothes that with natural dyes. A billion people. Okay. The Industrial Revolution created chemical dyes. So people found a way, uh, cl clothing makers found a way to dye very fast and very cheap. Yeah, and very dangerous. Right. Which, which they didn't care, yeah. no? So the, the, the pollution that that process would suddenly start making to our planet was not taken into, into consideration because it was still, even, even still now, no? More, more important to have fast and cheap products. Right. Um, so when we, as soon as we started Industry of All Nations, uh, uh, the second product we wanted to launch was we, we wanted to make jeans. Uh, so we started trying to figure out how to make jeans without polluting and hurting everybody. So that research took us to India and took us all this like magic and world of natural dyes, yeah. uh, which was almost ex extinct in India. Um, but that's where, before the revolution, that was India was a big clothing and they make of this planet. So that's that's why we went there. So well, no, so we find this little group of mad scientists. <laughs> <laughs> trying, to, uh, trying to test and research to like bring, like recreate all these, and they've been like doing it for 20 years. Yeah. But in 20 years, nobody gave them a chance to reapply their technique for the modern world. So when we got in contact with them, we connected really well. We started researching, and it, it's amazing we, what we, they we, do. Yeah, it's amazing. It um, really we, is. We figured out how to start dyeing like everyday wear for the modern world right. with completely natural dyes and beautiful colors. Yeah, and, and the, 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 what our partners in India, they've been working on for all these years is basically to perfect or to adapt the millinery techniques of dyeing with natural dyes mm -hmm. to the modern age where, uh, of course, we want to throw our clothing in the washer dryer right. and right. Uh, the color has to stay and it has to uh, wash and dry like a conventional chemical dye garment. Yep. So that's the big accomplishment. Um, yeah, that's, that, that makes a difference, especially in today's society where yeah. everybody, again, wants everything quickly, everything easy, which is, leads me to my next question, which is, um, I think this must be the tough part for a business like yours, where we do live in a society where it's all about fast fashion, it's all about throwaway, it's all about cost. How do you convince people to change their attitude to buy your product when it's not the cheapest thing, you know, on the shelf. 
Yeah. You know, but it's a, it's about education, I suppose. But has that been yeah, a big it's, challenge? It's, it's not the cheapest, but it's also not that expensive. Yeah. No, no, yeah. For example, uh, 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 we try to work with like the most like reasonable margins as we can. For example, uh, an industry T-shirt is like a naturally dyed industry of one T-shirt mm -hmm. is like forty-eight dollars. May comparing to uh, thirty thirty dollars chemically dyed from a uh, fast fashion brand, or maybe a chemically dyed T-shirt from a high-end brand that probably costs like three times more. So very much in price. Right, right. Yeah. But let's I mean, put it this way: you can't compete with the, you know, the big chain. Yeah, I know. Ten dollars a T-shirt or yeah. something like because that. Because right? also that's 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 something that those price points is something that let's call them it is is an artificial uh, value that uh, the fast fashion companies were in charge of creating, and yeah. and uh, the truth is that that's that's the problem, and people are realizing that. So. Do you uh, think? Do you see that change? Do you yeah. see yeah. that that's a trend yeah, sure. that's yes. becoming that. more popular? Sure. Yeah, we see that also like in the shop. Uh, now, now we can see live the reaction of people when they, in your new store. Yeah, yeah. When they counter our products. The conversation we have is incredible, no? Uh, how people are like, some people are completely aware and they come like shopping to us because they know they want to like have a positive effect in, with, their, with their buy. Right. But some people they don't know about, and when they hear what, what we say and the conversations and the information, they they cannot believe what's going on. I mean, people people people, uh, the, the, the people want to know. People want to get informed, and and the the, the process of of, of choosing uh, or deciding to buy something, the, the elements that comes to the table are starting to be different. It's not just about like oh how it looks if it's in trend. So. We're in that process, and people are asking a lot of questions. And uh, which is great that yeah. people are starting to become more curious. Yeah. Because there's one statistic uh, that I think is so alarming that most people don't know, right? To produce one ton of cotton, it takes 200 tons of water. Yeah. Right. Just to produce one ton. So things like that. How do you get that information out to the general public? You know, yeah. again. Oh, I get so mad about this. People just don't care sometimes. Yeah. They tune out. Yeah, yeah so people it's care. Hard. Not only that, for example, if people knew no, that to wear your red t shirt that you love, because you have a red chemical color on, you're polluting everything around, around the manufacturing place where that t shirt was made. Right. What do people say? And people live there. Yeah. People live in that area. People where live there, and, that's, and that happens everywhere in the world. Right. Not only. Somewhere far away, companies, factories here in, in downtown LA, yep. they're like dying with poison because chemicals are poison, and throwing the leftover, the, the residual waters, right to the water streams. Okay, so you guys, then what do you think it will take to get this message to the masses? I mean, it's great that people are coming into your store asking questions, but these are people who are already are aware. Yeah. What about the totally unaware? What, what do you think? That it, needs to be done. Yeah, I think I think the 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 message and the information, you know, be getting out there little by little, and maybe maybe not 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 maybe faster than a little because now with social media, right. and how um, on the way from from like a show like this that it's watched by millions of people and uh, so messages now they they takes very fast yeah. to That's spread. True. Um, and one. I mean, it, 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 has, it, Fernando, it, sorry. it has become uh, such a current uh, issue. Uh, the, the the problem the, the the world is facing and, and the pollution environment that uh, I guess in, in 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 every aspect of 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 what we do, our fo footprint of humans, this world, uh, it is it has to be considered and people are aware. Yep. Uh, it's today and everybody's talking about it. Um, so um, hopefully it's it's up to it's up to yeah. it's up to us the companies the people who are making things to to give an example and to communicate how a business uh, can be better for for the world and the environment for the people for everybody and that's true it has to make business sense too right you oh, you can't just do it for charity sometimes yeah. sometimes 100% charity is great but also when it comes to a business you have to make it work 
It has, it has to, to make sense. It has yeah. to work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and the process of, of uh, when you're innovating in anything, the, the process of, of uh, making business sense, uh, it's probably going to be different uh, to type of business that, that, are, that have already a formula. So, so that's a process and that's uh, maybe the, 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 the growth curve. It's, it's lower. Uh, but it's necessary as long as it's going in the right direction. Yeah, right? and also it's, yeah. it's basically we need to we need to stop thinking that the only reason we need to wake up and live for is to make money. <laughs> I think everything. I think that's that's where yep. you start. Yeah. No, I think we we need to wake up and live like to help each other. And if you help each other well and you solve problems, well, no, money will come. But to the, the 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 reason to make money that shouldn't that shouldn't that shouldn't control or that should be the motive of our of our humanity anymore. I love that motto. Thank you so much for sharing that. And Juan and Fernando, thank you so much for coming in and telling us all about your business. Thank I think you so it's much for yeah, inviting yeah, yeah. us. You're doing. Good thank luck to you. And I'll come by your store. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. You. Well, coming up next, solar power is still a relatively new technology, but it's already being re-innovated in clever ways with impressive results. We'll be right back. According to the U.S. Department of Energy, the demand for electricity in the United States alone will rise by a whopping 40% by 2032. Now, the resulting increase in carbon emissions will pose economic and environmental threats. Fortunately, one company seems to have come up with an innovative way to produce this much-needed power with help of the sun. John Coughlin is president of Solar Window Technologies, where a first ever electricity generating product is about to transform the world's windows into powerful conductors that generate electricity 50 times more efficiently than rooftop solar panels. Harnessing the sun's power using the existing surfaces of structures, we may soon see a time where skyscrapers and residential high-rises offset their power needs by simply generating their own and even banking energy. Joining us now from New York to tell us more about this new twist on solar energy is John Coughlin. John, welcome to Full Frame. Good to have you here. Thank you very much. Well, John, this is really, really actually very exciting stuff. The technology is pretty amazing. Tell me first how your technology differs from traditional solar panels. Well, Solar Window Technologies is a clean energy company. Think of taking a piece of glass, generating electricity on that glass, and putting that electricity generating glass on tall towers and skyscrapers to offset meaningful energy that those buildings demand. That's what we do. Okay, well, all right. There's one terminology uh, that is sort of very scientific, so I need to ask you to explain what this means. It's, uh, it's called photo, photovoltaic, is that correct? Tell yes, me in layman's terms what that means, because that's an integral part of this technology, right? Yes, it is. Uh, photovoltaic really has two root words, photo meaning light, and voltaic meaning electricity. So what we do is we take light energy and generate electricity on solar window. Okay. Now, you say that your technology is 50% more powerful than the normal solar panel technology. Why is that? How does it actually work? Acres of glass is the best way to look at it. When we're looking at a tall tower or skyscraper, we're looking at all sides of that building and for example a 50-story building has nearly six acres of glass so when we look at putting solar window on six acres of glass versus the really tiny footprint on the roof for PV or solar panels then we have a tremendous ability to generate energy for that building but more importantly six acres of glass is a lot easier to put solar window on than taking up the valuable six acres of land right. that in most cities like new york would be very difficult so if you can imagine one fifty-story building taking up six acres of land of central park it wouldn't take very long for a few skyscrapers to use up all that beautiful space right. so we're using all that acres of glass we're not using all the acres of land no you're right john i mean it would be impossible 
to do this in a big city because there would be no space for it. So the idea of using existing structures, that's what's so phenomenal, phenomenal to me. Now, it, tell me if I'm right about this. The flat glass industry overall is $100 billion. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So we're talking about a huge industry already that covers all of these skyscrapers around the world. And so if we should do that in the U.S. alone, I mean, what are we talking about here? What, what kind of business are we talking about here? The market potential is huge. Not only is it a $100 billion business, in the United States alone, there's over 400 million square feet of glass in commercial buildings. And that's also in taking into consideration the over 5 million commercial buildings in the United States alone. So when we look at the ability of one single 50-story building to offset meaningful energy for a building that currently doesn't have an option to do so, right. think of all those 5 million buildings that will have an option to, to generate their own electricity. I'm wondering, John, why hasn't anyone thought of this, this before? Because, I mean, obviously... I would have never thought of this, and the average person would have never thought of this, but it's pretty amazing. You know, everybody thought about just rooftop, but the fact that you came up with this concept of, of covering an entire building. Yeah, and, and really, solar window is a technology that's being developed for windows. We're not a technology that's being developed for some other application, and then as an afterthought, let's try to put it on window glass. Since its inception, the whole concept has been tall towers and skyscrapers, utilizing that vast space. But more importantly, when we look at those buildings, we want to be able to maintain the beauty of a window right. while making it architecturally pleasing, which has comes in our colors. Those colors have tints that we can increase, make them darker, more transparency. That way that gives us the ability to put this on a skyscraper and maintain the architectural beauty that the uh, architects and the building developers and owners are heavily sought after. And that, John, actually, I think is really crucial, isn't it, for this to work. Oftentimes in the past, solar panels, people complained about them because they weren't aesthetically pleasing. They didn't look very good on a rooftop house, so people chose not to go with that. In this case, when I was watching some of the video, you can't even tell that these, this glass is on the building, right? That's key. Transparency is an important factor. Just imagine sitting in your office, looking out the window at that beautiful cityscape, and just thinking of that window as that's the ordinary window that you've known all your life. It's a passive window. But now we're taking that passive window and making it generate electricity. And you, you can't see the electricity being generated, but you still maintain that beauty. And now that window is active, producing power for your office fixtures, for building fixtures, and other uh, fu functions in the building. Right, right. God, that, that's what I think is, is amazing about this uh, technology. But let's talk about cost, John, because as I mentioned before, solar panels in the past, one of the other deterrents was that they were expensive and they wouldn't get their payback in something like five to seven years. What about your technology? What's, what's the investment and then what's the payback? Right. Based on our um, proprietary power and financial modeling, using data that we've received for testing our modules at the United States Department of Energy, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. We took the power from those tests, modeled it in our proprietary model, and we show less than a one-year financial payback on a 50-story building. And the beauty of that is it's not just that economic incentive. It's got to go beyond that. First is it's manufacturability, easy to manufacture, so it's liquid. The other aspect of this is the cost. We need to keep the cost in such a line that it allows this to go to those tall towers and skyscrapers. And but more importantly, okay. it's the, also the environmental benefit. We're looking at 15 times the environmental benefit when compared to those same solar panels on that building, which is huge considering the importance of us controlling greenhouse gas emissions. Well, I was just going to ask you about that because let me just throw out some figures for you. 70% of all electricity relies on fossil fuels and 85% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions come from those fossil fuels. So what kind of savings are we talking about when it comes to using 
uh, your technology versus you know traditional utilities that offset is tremendous and extremely important when we're looking at greenhouse gas emissions we can open this up a little bit talk about carbon footprint we can talk about the economic incentives but when we look at it for example that 50-story building has the potential to offset 2.2 million miles of vehicle emissions that's a huge number when we look at that small rooftop space where that PV is up on that small rooftop that's the equivalent of about 176,000 miles so 2.2 mile, million miles from a vehicle is tremendous when looking at one single skyscraper that's one building so that is incredible if you multiply that by hundreds um, here's a question uh, what about China uh, you know we all know that China has a huge greenhouse gas gas emissions problem the pollution is reaching crisis levels over there uh, so is this something that you'd like to introduce to China because again also there's tremendous number of skyscrapers in China all over that country and they continue to build more the potential could be huge over there right our market strategy is global um, we feel that this technology can be put in geographic locations to help a world cause of controlling greenhouse gas emissions ultimately affecting climate and climate change so as we look at this technology we see this as a global application having a positive, favorable impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And John, I, I should ask you, is this already being used or is this still being introduced uh, to various developers just to see what the reaction is at this point? Yeah, our launch is next year. So we're looking at uh, the end of next year, uh, and this launch is predicated on a couple very important prerequisites. First is some important strategic industrial partners that's key to us they've got the ability to hit those global markets second is raising additional capital uh, we are in the process of raising capital uh, and as this interview is being conducted but more importantly to bring it back into perspectives there's people like Bill Gates Warren Buffett Elon Musk of Tesla we are in great company of some of the world's most energy advocates and innovators we're using some of the brightest minds in the development of our technology and some of the most creative minds in finance to help capitalize this technology ultimately to build solar window which may be perhaps one of the greatest single innovations in in clean en energy history I don't think that's an understatement, John, because of what I've seen and what I've heard from you. So I bet the response from others has been the same, excitement, uh, thrilled that this is uh, being introduced. Oh, the, the excitement has been tremendous. And this is not just from the architects, building owners, and developers' perspective. The, the excitement goes into the glass industry. Keep in mind that this is one of the greatest innovations to the glass industry in over half a century. Mm. So the glass industry has just looked at this as fantastic. But we also need to look at it from the perspective of the chemical industry. Our technology is chemistry. It's chemistry in the making, chemistry making electricity. So there's many industries that have brought this with great excitement and we're excited to be innovating. And do you think, John, that this is going to change the world in terms of the way people build, but also, more importantly, the environment? Well, we certainly hope so. We have put tremendous effort into Solar Window. We have tremendous outreach. We truly enjoy working with some of our strategic partners and some of our discussions. And all of that is the planning for a clean energy technology like Solar Window on a global outreach to help in a global perspective. Well, John, it was a pleasure talking to you and hearing all about your uh, company and the technology. It's pretty amazing stuff. So congratulations to you. Thank you so much. All right. We'll be right back with a look at a raging debate about sustainability solutions in our food supply. The world's oceans, lakes, and rivers are feeling the strain of overfishing. Dwindling supplies of some fish species have led to a rise in aquaculture, or the farming of fish and plants. 
So what's the difference between fish and aquatic plants raised on a farm and those caught or grown in the wild? And is one really better than the other? Full Frame's Mike Walter dives deeper into this debate in Portland, Maine. Just before sunrise. Uh, today we're harvesting. Um, we're going to do about a half a ton of mussels. Just a little harvest today. They leave the city far behind. Matt Moretti and his crew head out to their crops in the Casco Bay, just off the coast of Portland, Maine. We harvest year round. Um, yeah, we're going about twice a week right now. But instead of using a tractor on this three acre farm, they'll use their hands. Slowly easing up ropes that dangle high above the ocean floor. The mussels are suspended off the bottom, so there's a bunch of predators on the bottom, like crabs and starfish, lobsters, that love to eat mussels. These are Bangs Island mussels. Bangs Island mussels are um, it's our brand of farm-raised mussels that we grow here in Casco Bay. They are started in the wild and finished by us. While these farm-raised mussels are similar to those caught in the wild, there are differences. There is practically no grit or pearls in the mussels, which you do find in wild mussels um, sometimes, but a lot more meat uh, per mussel, so the, the meat inside the shell is going to be bigger. Uh, I think it's going to be sweeter and have a better flavor. Um, they are known pretty much throughout the nation um, as really high quality, excellent muscle. Farming seafood in a controlled setting as opposed to harvesting catch from the sea is known as aquaculture. The practice accounts for roughly half of the seafood production around the globe. China, by far, is the largest producer. While experts say there's little taste difference between the two, and nutritionally they're very similar, there is debate over whether wild-caught or farm-raised is better for the environment. When it comes to traditional fishing, the question becomes, is it sustainable or destructive? The only way we're going to have a sustainable uh, seafood in industry in the United States is by the addition of aquaculture. It will never happen again by all wild stocks. We will always rely on other countries to produce our seafood if we don't produce it ourselves. Former commercial fishing lobsterman Gary Moretti now co-owns Bangs Island Mussels with his son Matthew. Gary says because the world's fish stocks are strained, the production of farm-raised seafood, like his mussels, will only increase. This is a possibility of growing the highest level protein with the least impact to the environment. And we don't have a choice anymore. But not all aquacultures are good. Some have had a negative impact on the environment. In the case of shrimp farming, its development in the 1980s destroyed widespread areas of mangrove forest and caused coastal deterioration because of waste. It's an issue U.S. aquaculture expert Michael Rabino, a former shrimp farmer, is concerned about. We've learned a lot in the past 20 or 30 years about what to do and what not to do, so that we can avoid the negative issues and focus on the positive. So in the U.S. now, and in some other countries, we have what I might call smart aquaculture, with efficient technology, where there isn't any waste, um, and where we've got informed regulations, good regulations, that both allow the aquaculture industry to expand, 
but also protects our, our environment and allows for healthy oceans. Experts say with wild fish catches stagnant across the globe and the world's growing population eating more and more seafood, expect the gap to be filled with farm-raised options. But the market is so huge and the demand for seafood is so important that we need to complement that wild catch with responsible and sustainable aquaculture. Aquaculture, that when carefully managed, can feed billions of people and keep the world's waters healthy. For Full Frame, this is Mike Walter. And that is it for this week. Join the conversation with us on social media. We are CCTV America on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And now you can watch Full Frame on our new mobile app, available worldwide on any smartphone for free. Get the latest news, headlines, and connect to us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Weibo. Search CCTV America on your app store to download today. All of our interviews can still also be found online at cctv-america.com. And let us know what you'd like us to take full frame next. Simply email us at fullframe at cctv-america.com. Until then, I'm Maylee in Los Angeles. We'll see you next time.